will start. So uh, I'm Michael Bronstein. I'm a professor at Imperial College London and head of craft learning research at Twitter. And today I would like to talk about uh, geometric deep learning. So you might be wondering uh, what is geometric deep learning? What does it have to do with uh, what geometry or vice versa? What does geometry have to do with deep learning? So allow me to start maybe from uh, taking you uh, deep into the past. So for more than 2000 years, when we said the word geometry, it was uniquely understood as Euclidean geometry because simply no other geometry existed. And this Euclidean monopoly came to an end in the 19th century with the first construction of non-Euclidean geometries. Uh, I think the first one is credited to be uh, Lobachevsky, uh, Janusz Boyei, uh, Karl Friedrich Gauss himself, entertained uh, himself with these constructions, even though he never published them. And then in 1856, uh, Bernard Riemann, Gauss's student, published what we now uh, call Riemannian geometry. So what happened though very quickly is that basically these fields, different types of geometry uh, became siloed and uh, completely uh, disjoined from each other. And there was uh, a big fight between mathematicians of that time uh, who is right, whose geometry is better, what actually defines a geometry, and uh, what is the relation between, the, between different types of geometry. So the solution to this pickle came from a, a Felix Klein, a young professor that was appointed at the University of Erlangen in 1872. And as it was custom at that time in Germany, he was asked to uh, write and present a research prospectus where he would outline uh, the, the research for the end of his career, for the, the, basically the rest of his career. He was actually only 23 when he got this full professor uh, appointment. And uh, he wrote this prospectus that entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, in which he proposed quite a radically new idea. And the new idea was to approach geometry as the study of invariants or symmetries. In other words, properties that are preserved under some class of transformations. And the class of transformations was uh, formalized using the language of group theory, which was a new uh, creation at that time. It was uh, first introduced by Galois in, I think, uh, 1830. But then Klein, together with Sophus Lee, uh, worked extensively on this. So he just used this apparatus to formalize geometry. And in this way, the relation between geometry and what defines a geometry became completely clear. Because the moment you define a symmetry group, uh, basically the class of transformations that you apply, you immediately have certain structures that are preserved. So in Euclidean geometry, for example, when you consider rigid motions, there are many things that are preserved like areas, distances, angles. If you take a bigger group, the fine group, then many of these properties are not preserved, but you have, for example, parallelism. And then projective geometry is probably the broadest one. And immediately the relations are also evident because the fine group is a subgroup of the projective and the Euclidean is a subgroup of the fine group. And this idea was remarkably productive in mathematics. It allowed to solve problems that were uh, very difficult or completely unsolvable with the, the, with the uh, older tools. But it also spilled into other fields, in particular into physics. And in physics, uh, Emmy Neuter, who also was at Göttingen, uh, where uh, Klein ended up uh, for the rest of his career, she was uh, exposed to these ideas. And she uh, proved a remarkable theorem that allow to derive uh, conservation laws in physical systems from fundamental principles of symmetry. So uh, this is, if you think of it, this is completely uh, mind blowing because before that uh, conservation laws like conservation of energy were completely experimental. So you would observe an experiment for thousands of time and you see that the energy is preserved. So you would uh, deduce that, that, that uh, the energy preservation. But here for the first time, there was a mathematical way of deriving conservation laws from first principles of symmetry, like conservation of energy, for example, stems from symmetry of time. And these ideas had a profound impact in physics. So Hermann Weyl came up with the concept of gauge invariance that in a generalized form was developed by Young and Mills to unify different forces, which culminated in uh, the standard model, uh, the term that was introduced in 1975. And uh, this is all physics that we know nowadays, maybe with the exception of gravity that is not unified. Uh, it is all uh, 
I should quote Philip Anderson, another Nobel, Nobel laureate in physics, that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. So symmetry is really fundamental and really profound and, uh, and has long consequences. The question is, what does it have to do with uh, machine learning, right? So if we look at machine learning problems, at least in the simple setting of supervised learning, this is essentially a function approximation problem, right? So we are given some function that maps us from the input space, so let's say images of different animals, to the output space, let's say the labels. And in this case, we try, for example, to label the images, whether it's cats or dogs, right? So the problem of function estimation is very well understood problem. And uh, if you look at the first neural network systems, so the perceptrons, it was it became apparent that uh, even though these networks are very simple and they can approximate only simple functions, combine two such networks in two layers, what is called multi-layer perceptron, and then you can uh, represent step functions. The moment you can represent step functions, you can approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy. This property is called universal approximation. It was proven in the 80s. And basically, it means that these networks are very expressive. Practically anything, any good function can be represented in this way. Now, is it good or bad? Basically, the problem of approximating a function from a finite set of samples is very well studied. So in low dimensions, uh, this has been researched to death. We have a very uh, good mathematical control over the error. We know what classes of functions we can use and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, machine learning is not a low dimensional problem. Most of the, the machine learning problems need to deal with data that lives in thousands or maybe millions of dimensions. And there, the situation is entirely different. So this is an example of a Lipschitz function that looks like uh, Gaussian blobs that are attached to a ball and positioned in different quadrants of a unit, uh, unit cube. So the, mo the moment we start growing the dimensions, you see that the number of samples that is needed to uh, represent well this function grows exponentially. So this is what a phenomenon that we typically call the curse of dimensionality. It has many different manifestations. This is one of them. So to approximate a, a smooth function, a continuous function, uh, in D dimension, you need exponentially large number of samples, which in practical situations uh, make this learning completely uh, infeasible. And this is manifested in practical problems. So if you apply, for example, uh, these simple neural networks to images, so you can just vectorize the image right into, uh, into a, a long vector of pixels. The problem is that if I just shift the image, this representation is completely oblivious of the geometric structure of the input, right? It doesn't care that it's a two-dimensional grid. For such a neural network, it's just a vector. And therefore, we'll need a lot of examples to show to the neural network of different positions of the image uh, in order to train it uh, to, to, to be shift invariant. And this uh, problem, it never really worked. And this was one of the reasons why uh, Fukushima, in his uh, paper on neocognitron, uh, complained about perceptrons and similar architectures that they cannot cope with uh, shifts of the input. He applied uh, this, uh, this network to, to, uh, to image recognition uh, that, that uh, uh, was first attempted uh, around that time. And his inspiration came from uh, works uh, in neuroscience, the study of the visual cortex of, uh, uh, of animals, where uh, it was shown that uh, there is a local connectivity, what is called receptive fields, and this idea culminated in the classical work of Jan Lecan in the end of the 80s, the convolutional neural networks that basically take advantage of this uh, local connectivity and way sharing structure. Now, here's another problem. So here is a graph. So this is a molecule, a molecule of caffeine, if you're interested. And uh, let's say that we want to predict some of its property. Let's say binding energy to some target. So here, as before, we can uh, parse uh, the, the the node features into the into a vector, but now we don't really have a canonical order of the uh, uh, of the nodes like we might have with the two-dimensional grid. So any permutation here would work, and it appears that graphs are extremely common in many fields of science. They can be used to model social networks. They can be modeled to represent interaction between different biological entities in our body. They can be used in computer graphics, maybe with some extra structure in the form of meshes, and so on and so forth. And in, I think in 2015 or something like this, so when I was writing my uh, ERC grant, uh, 
uh, already everyone was working on deep learning. So I wanted somehow to stand apart and I decided to call it geometric deep learning with the idea that we want to, uh, to bring some fundamental geometric principles that would uh, allow us to build more principled uh, deep learning architectures and vice versa, apply deep learning techniques that were very successful in computer vision to uh, other non-Euclidean geometric data. And uh, this concept was popularized in a paper that we wrote with uh, Jean Brune, Jan Lecan, uh, Arthur Schlamm, and Pierre van der Kynes. So now geometric deep learning is used almost synonymously with uh, graph neural networks and graph representation learning. But I hope to convince you, even though today I will be speaking mainly about graphs, that this is just a small piece of a broader picture. And uh, we call this picture uh, geometric priors. So what I'm showing today is actually based on uh, a textbook that I'm working on with uh, a few colleagues with Jean Bruna, Petra Velichkovic, and Dako Cohen. So uh, this is, in a sense, the first time that, that uh, I'm trying to present it in this way. And uh, uh, I hope that, 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 that it, works, it works well. So if we look at our high dimensional uh, uh, learning problem, when uh, our input uh, lives in a high dimension, we need to understand that in many problems, like in case of images, it's not just high dimensional data. It has some underlying geometric structure. And this geometric structure forms an important uh, and very powerful prior. We call it geometric prior. So in the case of images, basically the image lies on a grid, right? So the way to think of it, f is a function that takes an image and produces a label. Then the image itself is uh, an element in a vector space of functions defined on the grid that is here denoted by omega. So the geometric structure of the grid is represented by the symmetry group. And here I should say that there are many ways of choosing the symmetry group because, uh, for example, we, if we want to deal with translations, we'll, uh, we'll look at the, tra the, the translation transformations, which are closed under composition. So it is a group. We can look also at translations together with rotations. This is what is called the special uh, Euclidean group. Uh, and finally, we can look at the full Euclidean isometry group, which also includes reflections. So the moment we define the group, what's important to understand about groups that they do not model how group elements act on other objects. So the group is a completely abstract object. It just tells us how, how uh, its elements are composed with each other. So here we are interested in the actions of the group elements on our domain. And in this case, the actions of the translation group, they just take points on the domain, on the grid or a two-dimensional plane, and translate it. Okay. Now, because we have an uh, image or a signal that is defined on this grid, the translation, the application of a group element to the grid also manifests itself in some change in the image. And this is done in representation theory through what is called the group representation. I denote it here by raw. So in case of translations, this is the shift operator. And you can see what it does to the image. So basically, it shift, shifts it by, uh, by a vector that uh, corresponds to the, to the group element uh, denoted here by G. And this is a very powerful concept. Basically, we can define functions that transform differently under the, the, uh, under the action of the group. So there are two ways of doing it. One of them is called invariance. So we call it G invariance or invari invariance under group G. When if I apply the group action on the image, right, for its representation row, and I apply then a function to it, I get the same result as if I applied to untransformed image, right? So like shift invariance, no matter where the digit is located in the image, I still want to say that this is a digit three. Another possibility is equivariance. And actually, these terms are very frequently confused. So equivariance means that if the output of the function is in the same space as the input, then if I apply first the, uh, the, 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 the transformation, the shift in this case, and then the function, or vice versa, first the function and then the shift, the result will still be the same. So in other words, these two operations commute. Now, you may ask why I write here a raw prime, because the output of the function doesn't necessarily need to live in the same space. In fact, in most uh, deep learning architectures, it doesn't. So I can apply, for example, uh, multiple convolutional filters to RGB image and get a 64 dimensional feature space. So I will need to use here a different representation. But I hope the idea, the idea is clear. And here you can get a, a general blueprint for geometric deep learning. Uh, 
So we will construct uh, a deep neural network from a collection of equivariant layers. So the, the input uh, the input will be piped through through these layers, which will be applied in sequence. Uh, and this way, uh, a transformation on the domain to the to the to the data that that uh, is provided as input will affect in the same way the output. And finally, if we want, for example, to do classification, we'll apply an invariant layer. I should say that it's common. Also, there is another geometric prior that uh, I will not talk in details about, which is uh, scale separation, and this is manifested in pooling. Basically, I need to course in my domain if I have a way to course in the domain, and I can approximate the functions by projecting them to the uh, to the uh, chorus domain and then uh, uh, computing the function on the on the chorus domain. So in images it works very well because we can course in the grid and still preserve the, the structure of the image uh, when we, we down sample it. So this is usually implemented as a max pooling in convolutional neural networks. So you can see that a lot of uh, deep learning architectures, I would say probably the majority fall under this uh, blueprint. And in fact, we like thinking of the different objects that can be addressed with this framework as the 4G of geometric deep learning. So the first of them is grids, right? So the, these are convolutional neural networks. We can generalize uh, grids still working with uh, uh, global transformations on some homogeneous space, such as rotations. Uh, so we can call these groups. Then there are graphs, which uh, have, uh, as we'll see, permutation uh, invariants. And finally, manifolds, well, to keep to the 4G, we like coding it uh, using the, the high energy physics terminology gauges, which is a, a physicist uh, term for uh, the selection of reference on manifolds. So think of it as the Erlangen program of deep learning. And I know that that uh, by using this bombastic title, I uh, I fall into the into the risk of sounding arrogant, basically uh, irreverently comparing myself to the great Felix Klein. So just keep it. Let's keep it modest. So uh, Erlangen program in the sense that we use the, uh, the the analogy or the philosophy of Klein of describing the structure of the domain uh, uh, using uh, the language of group theory and looking at invariance as a form of introducing an active bias into our architecture. So I should say that this concept is not novel at all. It has been explored in many fields of science, including in machine learning. And if we look at the uh, progress in, uh, in, in deep learning. So multi-layer perceptrons, they have weak inductive bias. It's not true to say that they don't have any inductive bias, even though they can represent any function, because usually we use regularization techniques such as weight decay and so on, which impose some function regularity. So the function will belong to a certain class of function. CNNs, uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, uh, they come from the, the perspective of uh, translation symmetry. Uh, this can be generalized with uh, group equivariant CNNs to, for example, rotations. Uh, in graph neural networks, uh, we have permutation inductive bias. And uh, for uh, intrinsic and the gauge equivariant CNNs, this is the local frame of choice. So I would like to talk about graphs because graphs are really universal models for systems of relations and interactions. You can find them everywhere at different scales of problems from nano scale uh, modeling molecules with graphs to interaction networks between different biological entities, such as protein-to-protein -protein interaction networks, and finally to macroscopic scale social networks, patient networks, uh, uh, you name it. And graph neural networks, unsurprisingly, have become recently one of the hottest topics in machine learning. You can model practically everything as a graph. So let's look at graphs from this perspective of geometric deep learning. Uh, a graph, well, probably the, the first thing that comes to your mind is a social network where you have uh, the nodes are users and the edges represent uh, their social relations or interactions. So mathematically, a graph is a collection of nodes, right, that have some abstract entities and edges that are just pairs of nodes. So we can consider either ordered pairs, which in this case the graph is directed, or unordered pairs in which case the graph is undirected. And let's assume that for simplicity, we assign some vector d-dimensional features to each of the nodes. And let's assume that the, the, the edges do not have any features, even though what I will describe next uh, is trivially generalizable to, uh, to edge attributes as well. So this is our construction. One key thing to understand about graphs that they don't have any canonical order of the nodes. So this is really the, 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 the key structural characteristic of graphs. Basically, when I take my 
uh, node features and I arrange them into a matrix, I have automatically prescribed some arbitrary ordering of the nodes. So this goes for the uh, node features. This also goes for the uh, adjacency matrix that I denote by A that describes the structure of the graph. So it has uh, non-zeros at positions where we have uh, edges between, between the nodes, right? And you can see that I can choose any arbitrary order. Uh, and the, the red here shows the position of the, of, the, uh, of the red node, and I can permute it in n factorial different ways, right? So P here denotes the permutation matrix that reshuffles the uh, rows of the feature matrix or the rows and columns of the adjacency matrix of the graph. So if I want to represent functions that work on this graph, I need to make sure that I'm either invariant through the permutation of the, uh, of the nodes, right? So it means that uh, if I apply the permutation to the rows of X and the rows and columns of A, I will get the same output, right? Pay attention that F here now depends not only on the node features, but it also, uh, we need to provide the structure of the graph in the form of the adjacency matrix. Permutation equivariance will come in the form of uh, the output of function being node-wise permuted in the same way as the input. Okay, so I hope, uh, I hope this is clear. So the way that these, these functions are constructed is usually looking at the local neighbors. So I will look at the neighbors, uh, uh, at the nodes that are connected to my node i, and I will take the features at these nodes. So one thing that is important to understand though, that even though the neighbors, their indices are unique, the features are not necessarily unique. So here you can see that two different nodes have the same features. I denote them by this blue color. So basically it's a, a generalized notion of a set where the same element can be repeated more than once. We call this multi-set or a bag, okay? So that's the, the, the features aggregated from the, uh, from the neighbors. And we can define a local function that acts on the current uh, 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 node feature and the multi-set of the neighbor node features, okay? So again, because there is no canonical ordering of the, uh, of the uh, elements in this multi-set, uh, this phi must work in a permutation invariant way, okay? So no matter how I permute the, uh, the rows in this, in this matrix. And I can re repeat this process many times at each, uh, at each node. So by this construction, I hope you can see that the function that we will eventually compute on all the nodes of the graph will be permutation equivariant. So by applying local permutation invariant functions, I get permutation equivariant function on the entire graph. And it appears that the choice of this function is extremely important. So basically the expressive power of this, uh, 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 of this choice can be related to uh, the following example. So here the black node is my node i, which I'm, uh, uh, at which I'm computing the function. And here you can see three different structures. So let's consider three possible uh, aggregation functions. Uh, they are all permutation invariant, maximum, sum, and mean, okay? So maximum would not care how many times uh, the red node, for example, appears, right? So the, the maximum of the, uh, of the left graph and the central graph will be the same, right? But the mean will be different. Okay. Now, if I look, if I apply the mean to the central and the right graph, it doesn't matter. The, the multi multiplicity of the of the features doesn't matter. So the mean will produce the same result, but the sum will not. So the bottom line that the choice of this function is important. So we need to select a function that is injective, and we can relate this to graph isomorphism test. So we say that two graphs are isomorphic if they are structurally the same, meaning that there is an edge-preserving uh, bijection between them. In other words, if we look at their adjacency matrices. I can uh, permute one of them into another, okay? Interestingly, the computational complexity of testing whether two graphs are isomorphic is unknown. We know that there is currently no polynomial time algorithm, but we also know that it's not NP-hard. So usually it's, it is placed into its own complexity class called GI, uh, uh, GI complexity. And uh, a classical algorithm in graph theory called the weiss ferrer lehmann test uh, proposes a color refinement procedure that takes these multi-sets of neighbors and uh, applies an injective function to them. So you start with a graph that has all the nodes colored in the same way, and then you refine 
uh, the colors based, based on the structure of the neighborhood. So here we have two different neighborhoods initially, neighbor, uh, neighborhoods with two uh, neighbors or three neighbors. So they get different colors, different labels. Now, when I apply the same procedure again, I now have three different neighbors. So I have two yellow neighbors, green and yellow neighbor and yellow and two green neighbors. So these get different colors. We now have three different labels. But if I repeat it again, I don't change the color. So at this point I stop and I compute the distribution of different colors or different labels. And if I take another graph and I compute the distribution of color using the same procedure, if the colors are different, then I can for sure say that the graphs are non-isomorphic. But if the colors are the same, then I don't know. They're possibly isomorphic. In other words, this is a necessary but insufficient condition. And we know that there exist examples of graphs for which the, the, the weiss ferrer lehmann uh, test fails. So they are not isomorphic, but it would consider it possibly isomorphic. And here you can see an example. So the graph on the right has triangles, whereas the graph on the left doesn't. So these graphs are undistinguishable using the, the WL test. So let me go back to the different aggregation functions. And uh, you see in the graph learning literature, there is a zoo of different architectures, fortunately, most of them fall into one of these three flavors. So basically, the update of the feature, right? So remember that, that in node i, we aggregated the, the, the features from the neighbors, and we then updated, we produced a new uh, feature vector that node. So we need some permutation in variety aggregation, uh, denoted by the square operator. It can be usually a sum or a maximum. We have two learnable functions, psi that transforms the, the neighbor uh, node features, and phi that uh, transform, basically that aggregates the information, that updates the, the, the node features. Uh, this is the new feature of the node. And uh, the first flavor is convolutional. So here the coefficients c are constant. They're independent of the features. They're dependent on the structure of the graph. And we can think of them as importance of node j to the representation of node i. Why we call this convolutional? Well, early uh, uh, architectures for graph neural networks came from generalization of convolution in the spectral domain. I will say a few words about it. And uh, you can derive the, the traditional convolution as a particular case uh, of, this, uh, of this formulation. The second flavor, we can call this attentional flavor. So in this case, these coefficients that represent the contribution of j to i are feature dependent. They can be computed using attention mechanism. And finally, the most general flavor is the uh, message passing flavor where we compute a general function that you can think of it as a message that, that node j sends to node i, and then we aggregate all of them and update the node i. And the typical graph neural network will contain uh, multiple such equivariant layers. Uh, and if we want to classify the entire graph, we will use an invariant layer. A global pooling basically will aggregate usually some all the node features and uh, then uh, output, the, the, for example, the, the, the graph wise label. We can also do coarsening. So we can do local pooling and uh, uh, it can also be learnable. So we can create a pipeline that uh, tells us for a specific task how to course in the graph in the best way. So before we go to grids, which will be another manifestation of, uh, of uh, these principles of geometric deep learning, let me show you a few interesting particular cases of uh, deep learning on graphs. One of them is sets. So if I take a graph and I remove all the edges from them, uh, from this graph, then I get a set, right? So in a set, I can do two things. So in a set, I don't have any uh, uh, edges between the nodes. I can assume that each node lives completely independently. And I can just apply a shared function phi to all the node features, right? And this is the deep set architecture. So this is by construction permutation equivariant, okay? So the second thing that I can do, I can assume that all nodes are allowed to talk to all other nodes. So in this case, the graph is a complete graph. And this is what we see in transformer architecture. So interestingly, if we use here the convolutional flavor because the aggregation here is on all the nodes, so the second argument in this function phi will be the same. So convolutional architecture is not good here. That's why we need to use an attentional architecture and usually uh, well, there are many nuances to, to practical uh, transformer architectures because they are applied to sequences. Unlike graphs, we actually do know uh, uh, some order of, uh, of nodes in a sequence. So they usually come with an extra feature that encodes uh, the position of the node, what is called positional encoding. 
And this can be also applied to graphs in the form of positional or structural encoding. For example, we can count some small graphs of structures and provide them as uh, extra input to message passing. And uh, this is a recent work that I did with, uh, with my students. Uh, basically, we show that uh, this, uh, this architecture is more powerful than the WL test. And because WL test is actually not a single graph isomorphism test, but an entire hierarchy of tests, uh, we can be more powerful with the right choice of the substructures than higher dimensional uh, vice federal element tests. And here you can see a counter example uh, for which the three WL test fails. So the graph on the left has a four click uh, and the graph on the right has a triangle. So four clicks cannot be detected by three WL test. But uh, if we provide them as a count to our message passing architecture in the form of structural encoding, then we can uh, distinguish between these graphs. And uh, the last instance of this uh, setting I would like to mention is that in many cases we are not given a graph. So we are given a set. It can be a point cloud in high dimensional feature space. And uh, we want to use a graph that is optimal for the given task. So the first architecture, uh, to my knowledge, that, that uh, did this uh, was a work that we did with collaborators from MIT with Yu Wang and Justin Solomon, which we call dynamic graph CNNs. Basically, it was applied for problems in computer vision and graphics for three-dimensional point clouds where the graph was constructed on the fly as a k-nearest neighbor graph. But in general, uh, you can think of that in many situations, you are still given an input graph, but you do not necessarily need to stick to this graph to, to, uh, to propagate information uh, on, on your graph. So you can decouple the computational graph from the, uh, uh, from the input graph. And there are many reasons why to do it. It could be due to computational efficiency. You want, for example, to subsample the graph. You can denoise the graph. Or uh, you can re resolve uh, issues such as information bottlenecks when you have to squeeze a lot of information uh, by means of message passing to a single feature vector. So let's talk about grids. Grids, as you can imagine, are particular instances of graphs. So uh, if I assume a grid with periodic boundary conditions where we wrap around the signal across the boundaries, then uh, this is called the ring graph. Now, it might sound that uh, grids, well, they're just uh, the same as graphs. And uh, here we have exactly the same graph neural network, but uh, uh, maybe slightly simplified. But actually, the story is completely different for grids. And the reason is that if we look at the neighborhood structure. It's not only that each node has the same number of neighbors, we always have two neighbors, but also the neighbors are not uh, permutation invariant. The order is actually fixed. I can always talk about my previous neighbor and my next neighbor, right? So the function, the local aggregation function that we've seen before in graph neural networks that uh, took as input the unordered multi-set of neighbors, now the order is fixed, so instead of Having an input xi and this multi set of xi minus one, xi plus one, I have a fixed order of my nodes xi minus one, xi, and xi plus one. And if I design this function phi to be just a linear function, just weighted combination, I get something that looks very familiar, right? So if I write it as a matrix, the mapping from the input to the output, it will have this multi diagonal structure. We call these matrices circle matrices. They can be formed by just uh, shifting cyclically uh, a vector of parameters and appending it to form uh, this matrix. So circular matrices are synonymous with convolutions. And what we know about convolutions, that they commute. So usually matrix product is not commutative, but circular matrices are special, so they do commute. And in particular, they commute with shift. So if you choose this particular matrix that shifts the uh, elements of the vector by one position, again, modulo n with wrap around, uh, then we see that no matter if we first apply the shift and then convolution or vice versa, the result will be the same. Even more than that, we can actually characterize convolutions in this way. So this statement goes both ways. So it's an if and only if statement. Uh, a matrix is circled or is a convolution if and only if it commutes with shift. So you see that that. One of the, the, the cool things about uh, this uh, invariance uh, fundamental principle was that you can derive uh, properties or derive architectures from principles of symmetry. So you see it manifested here. So I tell you that I want shift equivariance, commutativity with shift, and it follows that the only linear operator uh, 
that will commutely shift must be a convolution, must be a circuit matrix. Now, what else do we know about circuit matrices? We know that they're jointly diagonalizable, right? And it means that there is a common set of eigenvectors that uh, basically transforms the matrices into a diagonal form. And it's enough to pick up one of these matrices and look at its eigenvectors. It's convenient to look at the shift. And surprise, surprise, the eigenvectors of the shift appear to be the Fourier basis. So the shift operator is diagonalized by the Fourier transform. And as a result, convolution, any circuit matrix is diagonalized by the Fourier transform. So when you hear people saying that uh, the convolution operator is diagonalized by the Fourier transform, that's exactly it. Basically, any convolution can be expressed in this new system of coordinates. Fourier transform is uh, basically you can think of it as a multidimensional rotation, right? So it's a change of coordinates. In this system of coordinates, convolution becomes a diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements actually also have a closed form expression. That's the Fourier transform of the vector W that forms this, uh, this matrix. And this gives uh, what is called the convolution theory, which is a dual view on how to compute convolution on grids. We can compute it either as a circuit matrix or in the Fourier domain by applying the Fourier transform and multiplying element-wise by the Fourier transform of the, of the filter, right, of this uh, matrix, and then computing the inverse Fourier transform. And the two views are equivalent. On graphs, you can generalize the notion of Fourier transform by looking at the adjacency matrix, because the adjacency matrix of the ring graph is the shift operator, or the graph Laplacian. And this has been done in early works on convolutional networks on graphs, where uh, basically the analogy of the, to the Fourier transform was exploited for doing filtering in the Fourier domain. So let me say a few words. Uh, in the remaining time about what, what's next in store for uh, deep learning on graphs. And uh, one thing that uh, brought the revolution in deep learning was the combination of data computing power and software. We don't really have anything similar in graphs yet, and, until recently at least, something that would uh, compare in the complexity and scale to image net for graphs. Now there is the open graph benchmark that was introduced last year that has multiple use cases, multiple uh, data sets and multiple problems. And graphs are much richer in terms of different problems compared to images and also in, in terms of scale. So you can uh, have small graphs like molecules with maybe a few tens of nodes and gigantic graphs like social networks with hundreds of millions of nodes. Uh, there are already uh, developed and professionally uh, maintained industry sponsored libraries such as DGL or PyTorch Geometric. So I think there is uh, ongoing democratization of these methods. There is uh, a lot of research about efficiency and scalability, so how to apply these architectures to large-scale industrial problems. That's what we're uh, trying to do at Fisher as well. Uh, interesting uh, settings in um, industrial applications such as social networks is that the graphs are not static but dynamic, so it's correct to think of these graphs uh, as a stream of asynchronous events that form the graph, for example, node or edge insertion or deletions. And uh, for this purpose, uh, there are a few uh, architectures that, that uh, deal with, with this setting. Uh, we developed a generalization of message passing networks at Peter that we call temporal graph networks that essentially learn uh, uh, a memory that compresses all the interactions of a node, uh, all its participation in events, and it, you can train it in a self-supervised way. So basically predicting future edges at certain, certain uh, point of time. And this can be used for recommend a system, for example, when on Peter, uh, we can recommend whom to follow based on your previous interactions. Uh, it is interesting to look at higher order structures. So uh, message passing architectures are all built on uh, uh, nodes and edges, but we know that in many natural uh, networks, we have also uh, higher order structures or graph motifs such as triangles, clicks, and so on. So uh, with uh, graph abstraction networks, maybe this is the most straightforward, uh, somewhat naive way of incorporating this, this information. But it, it is more interesting to look at, for example, simplicial complexes and do uh, a generalized form of message passing that takes into account uh, these higher order structure. So I mentioned already latent graphs. So let me say a few words about it uh, more in detail. So if you look at some applications of uh, graph neural networks for uh, in the biomedical domain, for example, uh, uh, colleagues at Imperial College did this first work on using graph neural networks for disease prediction. 
the graph was constructed in a handcrafted way. So that was based on demographic similarity between patients. And they were trying to pre predict Alzheimer disease based on imaging data that was attached to each of the nodes of this graph. But we know that uh, this handcrafting doesn't work because for some diseases, the, the similarity of patients might be completely different. So we can learn this graph uh, in a task specific way. So the way that it works, we have two different uh, feature spaces. One is used to construct the graph as K nearest neighbor graph. And another one is used as the features, the features on the nodes of this graph that are then uh, being diffused by the graph neural network. So we call this DGM, differentiable graph module. And uh, we show uh, in a, a work with collaborators from uh, Technical University of Munich that uh, it achieves significantly better results compared to, to previous uh, methods in this domain. I should say that uh, maybe this gives a, maybe a new perspective or refreshed look at uh, some classical methods that were termed manifold learning or nonlinear dimensionality reduction, which came with the premise that uh, we have very high dimensional data that uh, even though it's high dimensional, its intrinsic dimensionality is low. So if you can think of images, for example, then uh, indeed images might live in a million dimensional space, but somehow the number of degrees of freedom that uh, describe them is small. So this can be captured by a graph, a, near, a nearest neighbor graph, and then you can preserve some structures on this graph like geodesic distances to lower the dimensionality. For example, isomap works uh, with multi-dimensional scaling that uh, tries to preserve the geodesic distance on the graph. And then you apply some uh, uh, ML methods such as clustering. The problem why this never worked, it is still used for data visualization, but it's not really a useful tool in machine learning because uh, the uh, different stages of this algorithm are independent of each other. And you really need to handcraft the feature space where you represent your data and how you construct the graph and how you embed it to produce meaningful results. So graph neural networks, the, the modern deep learning architecture give uh, a new fresh look at this. Basically, you have a, an end-to-end -end differential architecture where you can apply for your specific task, do the learning on the graph itself. And therefore, I expect that we'll see uh, more instances of this manifold learning 2.0 with modern uh, uh, graph neural network architectures. So taking this maybe even step further, what is called algorithmic reasoning, so we can think of learning uh, interactions between uh, some complex entities that might have a certain structure description. And what I mean by this is think of uh, uh, a multi-particle system in physics where you have multiple particles that interact with each other. So we can describe the interactions as a graph. We can learn using a standard uh, um, graph neural network uh, the way that these uh, particles interact. And once we learn these uh, general functions, usually the, the message passing functions are implemented as small neural networks, we can do symbolic inference. We can replace them by symbolic equations that describes the interactions. And replacing these, uh, these uh, uh, generic functions with symbolic equations, we actually get better generalization. But not only that, we get interpretability. We can actually derive, we can learn automatically, for example, the laws of, uh, uh, of Newtonian mechanics. So that was very cool work by uh, Kyle Kramer and, and collaborators. And they apply it to also much more complex systems and, and more complex physics. So if you think of somebody like Johann Kepler that spent uh, most of his life uh, uh, pouring over uh, uh, astronomical observation data, now you can learn the Kepler and more complex uh, 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 equations of motion in a few minutes from your data using this kind of uh, neural networks. So the last thing that I would like to mention uh, is theoretical understanding. And well, uh, there are many interesting flavors to, to, uh, to uh, uh, expressive power of graph neural networks, but also the generalization power. And uh, basically, whether uh, th this is maybe a naive construction with, where we pick out some selected, uh, uh, selected uh, small graphs, we could uh, uh, ideally try to build them from the data itself. Uh, and the question of generalization, of course, how generalizable are graph neural networks, which is the other side of uh, the, the expressive power, is uh, uh, currently far from being understood. So let me finish with the last but not least thing, which is killer apps. And this is probably the cool thing where uh, graph neural networks shine, because they can really address a very broad range of applications. And again, for a reason, these methods uh, have become so prominent, and I would call them first class citizens in the machine learning community. So one application uh, that is interesting when it comes to social networks 
is the problem of misinformation or so-called fake news. And there is empirical evidence that shows that fake news propagate on the social network differently from, uh, from true news. So we can, they are a little bit similar to, to viral infection. So what we try to do, we try to look at cascades of news that were related to certain political claims that were professionally fact-checked by, uh, by journalists and this way would have true or false labels. So I'm throwing out uh, many nuances of this problem, but just to think of it as a binary classification problem. So we have a cascade of uh, retweets, let's say, of a story that propagates on Twitter and an associated label. So we can try to learn whether a story is fake or not. And we show that uh, we, we, we can do it quite efficiently and accurately given uh, a few hours of, of propagation. And with my students, I founded a company called Fabula AI that uh, tried to predict uh, misinformation on Twitter. And obviously, Twitter was interested in this. So this company was acquired uh, uh, in 2019. And that, that's how I, together with my student, students, ended up uh, working at Twitter. So at Twitter, you can use graph neural networks uh, for many problems because Twitter, the, the two kinds of content that it has is the text or the images and the graph, which describes uh, something that is visible publicly, such as uh, uh, the follow graph or the engagements with content, but also something that is not exposed to the public, such as, for example, we can see whether a user logs in from some suspicious IP address and uh, might be associated with some uh, farm of trolls uh, in Moscow that, that are injecting fake, in the fake news. So one uh, classical application is uh, a recommender system. So you can think of it as a problem of link prediction. So you, you get an input graph, let's say a follow graph of Twitter users, you embed it into some space where you try the, 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 the similarity or the distance between embeddings to be proportional to the probability of an edge to exist between two nodes. And basically this is a, a self-supervised way of uh, of uh, training this neural network, you try to reconstruct uh, the data. So it's an encoder decoder architecture. And when a new user comes, you can uh, try uh, to suggest the users that uh, he or she might like to follow. So another interesting uh, use case is uh, drug discovery and design, which is an uh, expensive and long process. So the problem with drug design that uh, the number of uh, compounds that we can test in the lab or in the clinic is extremely small. The number of candidates is extremely large. We need somehow to bridge the gap between the two. And uh, this can be done with computational methods. So traditional methods use either quantum mechanical simulations or some simplified version of it. So graph neural networks were shown to excel here to be orders of magnitude faster and uh, of the same accuracy. And this is already old results. So this was uh, the work of Justin Gilmer from DeepMind in 2017. More recently, last year, the group of Jim Collins from MIT, they showed that you can use graph neural networks to do virtual screening of uh, antibiotic compounds and actually discovered a new class of antibiotics that has a broad range of uh, uh, effect on uh, antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. Uh, not only that they showed it computationally, but they also did in vitro and in vivo experiments on mice. So they discovered a new drug that they called halicine that, that is a, a likely a new antibiotic candidate. So with collaborators at Imperial College, we are uh, looking at uh, a slightly different idea while also predicting drug, uh, uh, drug li uh, uh, likeness, but we are trying to apply these ideas to, to, uh, to, uh, to compounds contained in food. As you may know, plant-based food uh, actually contains a lot of compounds that are chemically similar to oncological drugs. And uh, this way we train the classifier that predicted whether a drug uh, is likely to have anti-cancer effects from the way that it interacts with the network of proteins, which are common drug targets. And this way we had an anti-cancer classifier that we then applied to food molecules. And uh, this allowed us to build uh, what we call the food map of, uh, uh, of uh, food ingredients that are rich with uh, not only in concentration, but also in diversity of uh, these compounds. And uh, we call the champions in this uh, food map uh, uh, the hyperfoods. So the good thing about food that that uh, it is cool and everybody likes it. So we collaborate with the molecular chef Joseph Youssef, who uh, takes uh, uh, these ingredients and tries to to, to make some uh, cool uh, looking and yummy dishes that, uh, uh, that everybody can uh, easily cook at home. So I should say that uh, this completely ignores interactions between uh, between compounds and interactions are important. And in fact, 
the, 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 the dark matter of combinatorial drug therapy, because usually we don't take, just take a single pill. When we take drugs, usually drugs have side effects. So you take another pill to counter the side effects, then you counter the effect of the second drug. And uh, it is not uncommon to take multiple drugs at the same time. So the side effects are multiple. Uh, many of them are unknown. Many of them uh, uh, may be harmless or innocuous. Some of them can be uh, can be dangerous and, and uh, potentially lethal. So uh, Marinka Zitnik uh, wrote a, a already classical paper where they try to predict side effects of uh, uh, pairwise drug combinations using graph neural networks. And uh, I'm involved in the collaboration with uh, Mila and um, uh, uh, UK uh, pharma company called Relation Theoretic, where we try to predict drug synergies uh, as a cure against uh, COVID-19, because some uh, drug interactions may not only be uh, negative, they can also be positive. So the last thing in this domain of drug uh, design, I would mention the work that I did with collaborators in Switzerland, where uh, we use geometric deep learning to uh, do de novo design of proteins. And this is also a very interesting set of applications uh, in cancer immunotherapy. So the, the mechanism of this therapy is that there is uh, a, a protein complex, basically two proteins that bind to each other and they indicate uh, to the immune system that this is a healthy cell. So cancers learn to, to express these proteins and they become, uh, 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 they, they, they become immune against the normal action of the immune system. So the idea of immune therapy is to block one of these proteins. They're called program death ligands or PD-1 or PDL one the problem that traditional drugs uh, usually look for pockets on the, on the molecular surface of the protein and protein to protein interactions usually have flat interfaces like what is shown here in red and they're considered to be undruggable. So the idea is to design a, a small protein or a peptide that will bind to this interface and will block this mechanism and will allow the immune system to kill the malignant cells. So with genetic deep learning, we show that we can design, uh, design these proteins completely from scratch. And uh, this paper appeared on the cover of Nature Methods uh, last year. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite of a record to have uh, two uh, major uh, uh, journals in the, in the biological domain to run cover stories on, uh, on uh, genetic deep learning uh, uh, methods. So let me, let me conclude, I think I'm out of time. So uh, the Erlangen program of BL, I hope it doesn't sound arrogant, tries to uh, construct uh, neural network architectures and inductive biases from fundamental principles of invariance. I talked about graphs and grids, but there are many more to this. So we can have uh, also uh, more interesting cases, uh, uh, equivariance on manifolds. Uh, and we did some of the first works in this domain with uh, intrinsic uh, geodesic convolutional neural networks. And I guess uh, the, 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 the conclusion is that uh, these are really uh, new and very hot methods. They have big promise in industrial applications, in particular in healthcare, in, in biology. There are already several success story, uh, stories and uh, state-of-the-art results, but if at all uh, you had to take one message home then I think it's really a unifying framework to, uh, I would say 99% of the different architectures that exist in deep learning, maybe with the exception of reinforcement learning. So whether it's convolutional neural network, recurrent neural network, transformers, graph neural network, they all stem from the same principles. And uh, I hope that these principles will transcend the specific implementation. So maybe today we are obsessed with deep neural networks, maybe tomorrow it will be something else. I think the principles are more powerful and they can be implemented in, in other ways. But also it's uh, a principled recipe to construct new types of architectures that are suitable for the specific problem at hand. And again, I would like to mention that, that probably in the biological domain, uh, there is the biggest promise and hopefully this year or in the next few years, we'll see more and more applications that uh, might potentially transform the way that we design and discover drugs and eventually affect the lives of uh, each and uh, every one of us. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much.